Hello everyone. Today we'll be talking about how to figure out PO2 if you do not have any BZ available to you. So let's get some terminology out of the way. The A in the PO2 and SAO2 stands for arterial. In pulse ox, your saturations are denoted by SPO2. To get a PO2 without an ABG, use pulse oximetry and a table which is derived from your hemoglobin dissociation curve. And in this, I just want you to remember one number, PO2 of 60 equals 90% of SATs because you are aiming for your patient SATs to be more than 90%. So you want your PO2 to be more than 60. You get SATs from your ABG and pulse oximetry and sometimes these don't match. And there's always a discussion which one is more accurate. So let's dwell into this for a bit. Please watch my previous lecture, how pulse oximetry work for more details. A major limitation of pulse oximetry is these are not reliable if you got poor waveform, for example, patient with shock or hypertension. There can be error if you have got faulty sensor or different path length of the two wavelengths. You can get error rates in darker skin pigmentation. There is a delay of six to 10 seconds before measurement and there is an error rate of around 2% and these are not reliable below sets of 75% or hemoglobin of less than 5 grams. The main problem with the pulse ox is your signal to noise ratio. If you've got too low signal or too much noise, you can get false readings. Too low signals can be seen in hypertension, peripheral artery disease, blocks, and peripheral visual constriction and you can have too much noise if there's a shivering, too much motion or too much ambient light. So move your pulse ox to more pulsatile areas, for example, nose and lips, reduce the movements and remove the ambient light. The way pulse ox meter works is by looking at the ratio of absorption between red and infrared rays, and it plots that onto a preformed curve. So for example, if your ratio of absorption of red to infrared is around 0.8, it's going to plot it on that green line and will give you sets of 80%. Anything that changes the absorption ratio other than hemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin can give you wrong readings. And there are substances that have different absorption spectra in red and infrared. And those include melanin, A1C, methylene blue, methemoglobin, etc. Other important thing to remember is the pulse oximeter are not calibrated for lower SATs and have been calibrated in real person only between 75 to 100 percent less than 75 percent these are extrapolated ratios and again the sats are around 6 to 10 seconds old so if you are dealing with rapidly changing situation your sats are not current and your patient may be more hypoxemic than you think different path lengths can have different absorption in red and infrared and can affect your saturation in these cases change the site of pulse oximeter and see if your readings improve you can have a faulty sensor, which can have differential absorption in red and infrared region, giving rise to false readings. And in these cases, change your pulse oximeter. Pulse oximeter is not good for figuring out carbon monoxide poisoning. And similarly, ABG SO2 will be also very poor in figuring these two problems as well. To figure these out, the ABG machine does any something extra called co-oximetry, which uses four wavelengths, and they should spit out this number. In your oxygen status and you can look at your f met hb and f cohb levels to figure out if you have carboxy or methemoglobinemia so now let's see how good are the saturations on arterial blood gas one of the most important limitation of sats on abg is that these are calculated from po2 and not measured and this can be a serious problem let's see how the abg machines calculates sats from a po2 it measures your PO2 and it fits into a standardized oxyhemoglobin curve and gives you SATs. So if your PO2 is 60%, it will draw a straight line and where it intersects with the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, it will give you the percentage SAT. But the problem is your patient hemoglobin dissociation curve may not be the same curve because it is affected by your pH, PaCO2, temperature, level of 2,3 BPG. So let's say if your hemoglobin saturation curve is shown in a red line, the real SATs will be 73% while the ABG SATs will show you 90%. In these cases, pulse oximetry will give you much more closer approximation to the real number. This is one of the biggest limitations of believing SATs from an ABG. Scientists have tried to adjust for pH, temperature and base excess and have gotten pretty close to a real number. However, they still 
don't account for level of PCO2 and 2,3 BPG level. For example, in this ABG, your PO2 is 77. And looking at the standard number, your PO2 of 77 should correspond to SATs of 95%. However, the machine has corrected for your pH, temperature and base axis and is giving you 92%. So even these numbers are getting more accurate, they're still far from being gold standard. Other problem with the ABG is that people start focusing on PO2 and not on the SAO2. For example, you would have noticed that if your PO2 is around 60 to 65, Many medical providers will like to change your ventilator setting to improve this number. However, on a closer look, you realize that PO2 of 65 is actually SATs more than 90%, which is very reasonable for a critically ill patient. The problem emanates from looking at the normal range on ABG, which shows 75 to 105. Understand that PO2 of 75 corresponds to SAT of 95%, which is much higher than you are aiming for. Your aim in critically ill patient is to aim SATs 90% and above. Other important thing to understand is the oxygen saturations affect the oxygen delivery. And you remember your oxygen content equation where your dissolved oxygen is very small and most of the oxygen is carried by the hemoglobin molecule. So for example, your fall in PO2 from 100 to 40 would normally result in oxygen delivery of 5 cc. However, if your curve is shifted towards the left, for the same amount of PO2, your oxygen delivery has dropped. And if your dissociation curves moves to the right, your oxygen delivery has now improved. So hypercapnia, acidosis and fever may not be bad for your critically ill patient as they result in more oxygen delivery. Bottom line, oxygen delivery depends on oxygen sats and not PO2. ABG is also painful and expensive. And more importantly, you are possibly delaying critical decision and taking up time from respiratory therapist who could be doing something to help the patient. Say for example, the pulse ox sats are 85%, the patient is hypoxic and your reflex would be to get an ABG. However, understand that your PO2 will be low because your sats are low. You're not getting any additional information about hypoxia from the ABG. You have to do something to help this patient and improve the oxygen sats and not wait for five to 10 minutes to get an ABG. You want to do other things for the patient, but you have used up your respiratory therapist in getting that blood gas. I'm not saying that never get an EBG. If you don't have a good waveform on your pulse ox and you suspect that your patient is hypoxemic, or you want to look at other things on EBG like pH, PaCO2, lactate, etc., go ahead and get one. EBG also only gives you a snapshot in time and can give you a false sense of security in rapidly changing situation. So your patient's O2 sats can be much lower 5 minutes after that ABG has been drawn. Other problem with the ABG is one ABG gets more ABG because both there can be abnormalities in ABG and you want to correct them and you want to follow up the PaO2, pH and PaCO2 and therefore get more ABG and soon there are multiple ABGs for this patient. ABGs also use 2 to 10 cc's per draw and we know that the blood draws are commonest cause of anemia in ICU. An average amount of blood draw in ICU is around 70 cc per day. And there are a slew of tests that doctors send for a patient. Understand that the normal person only makes 50 to 60 cc of blood per day. ICU patients have relatively more bone marrow suppression because of various inflammatory processes going. So they make even lower amount. So no wonder everybody in ICU is anemic and gets a GI consult. The reputability of blood gas parameters is also questionable. In a study by Mallet et al., they looked at the various ABG parameters in two simultaneous ABGs and looking at the PO2 levels difference between the two ABG, you can see that the scatter is as high as 20. On an average, the 95% confidence interval in comparing two PO2 values was plus minus 9 millimeters. That means if a PO2 is 65, it can lie anywhere between 56 to 74. So what should you do? You should get an ABG if pulse ox has a poor waveform or you want to assess other parameters that come with the ABG, for example, pH, PaCO2, hemoglobin levels, lactate, etc. Or if you just place your patient on the ventilator. Once you get the ABG, compare your SATs of ABG and pulse oximetry, look at their concordance and use a pulse oximetry for following the oxygen SATs. If you do have trouble in getting good waveform on the pulse ox, you can certainly order ABGs as needed. Avoid routine daily ABGs and only order ABGs as needed depending on the clinical question.
Sometimes your SATs on EBG and SPO2 are quite different. And the question is which one to believe is correct. And there's no really good or clear answer that I could find in the literature. However, there are two steps that you should be doing. First, rule out the real saturation gap. And second, evaluate which modality is giving you the better answer. Saturation gap is the difference between the SATs from EBG and pulse ox. So for example, a patient with carbon monoxide poisoning his SATs will be normal in both ABG and pulse ox, so there will not be any saturation gap. However, in patients with methemoglobin, your ABG SATs will be normal. However, your pulse oximeter will show lower SAT because methemoglobin has some absorption in red and infrared, which is different from hemoglobin. So you will see saturation gap. You can see saturation gap in multiple other situations where there is a difference in absorption between these two wavelengths. For example, faulty sensors, poor readings, melanin, A1C, methylene blue, etc. Compounds that have similar absorption spectra when compared to hemoglobin will not show any saturation gap. So once you have ruled out the cause for real saturation gap, go ahead and use pulse ox. If you have got good waveforms, reproducible SATs at different sites and your SATs are above 80% and most likely your SATs will be correct within plus minus 2%. If you have a poor waveform, or pulse oximeter numbers are not reproducible, you can certainly use SATs on your ABG. However, understand that these can also have error rates. Most of the published literature compares your SpO2 to ABG SpO2 for accuracy of the SATs from your pulse ox, and they assume that SATs on the ABG is more accurate. None of those papers actually talk about SATs being calculated. And we know that calculated SATs from an oxyhemoglobin curve has serious limitation and this is not really a gold standard. So we really don't know the answer is which one is more accurate. I would like to hear your opinion on this topic as well. Please let me know what your thoughts are in comment section. So is it always necessary to get an ABG after every ventilator change? The answer is no. You don't have to get an ABG. Pulse oximetry gives you accurate SATs if you can get good waveforms and have good repeatability. In summary, no one way is perfect. As long as you understand the advantages and limitations of both methods, you should be able to better take care of your patient. Limitation of pulse oximetry include poor waveforms and error around 2%. And major limitation of EBG is that it is a calculated SATs. So it may not be accurate in patient with depleted 2-3 BPZ or high or low PSU2 level. And there is an error rate of 5 to 10 millimeter mercury. Thank you.